Five, four, three, two, one. From Hotel Tech Report, it's Hotel Tech Insider, a show about the future of hotels and the technology that powers them. Today on the show, we have Dave Burkus. I first met Dave while I was speaking on an entrepreneurship panel at a local business school. So shout out to Chris over at Whistle Guest Messaging for making that happen. During our chat, Dave joked with me that he's older than Warren Buffett. And just like the Oracle of Omaha, Dave shows no signs of slowing down. For those of you who don't know about Dave, he's the founder of Computerized Lodging Systems, one of the first property management systems on the market. His company grew so rapidly that he was able to make the Inc. 500 list twice and completely dominate the hotel technology market. Dave also created Fosse, the property management system technology that Marriott used for almost 36 years. After a long and storied career in hotel technology, Dave went on to become what Inc. Magazine called a super angel, making more than 150 investments in startups and achieving an unbelievable rate of return. Today, Dave spends most of his time as chairman of Tech Coast Angels, one of the most active angel investment groups in the world. He's also a managing partner at Wayfair Ventures, which is a travel technology-focused venture capital fund based here in Los Angeles. Dave was recently inducted into the HFTP Hall of Fame, and he's a best-selling author, so go check out his book, Burkonomics. It's unbelievable. Dave has spent the last couple of decades dedicating himself to help young entrepreneurs start businesses and change the world, and we're really lucky to have him here on the show today. Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Jordan, that was nice. I guess I have nothing more to say. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a wrap. <laughs> that's a wrap. So I think there's something like 700 property management system vendors globally on the market today. And I know that you weren't the first, but what number were you? I think uh, computerized lodging systems, which was known as Berkus uh, Compu Systems way back when, was probably the third of the PMS companies. Eco was the first in Santa Ana, California. IBM was the second. And then there are several of us that contend that we were the third, but it was early. It was 1974 when I wrote it in 1976, when it first began uh, being installed in hotels. And lucky for me, the IBM system was being installed at the brand new Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles and at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas. And both of those IT managers gave me a chance to sit through a little bit of the process and the night audits. And from that, I had the idea that I could do it better and faster and cheaper with a mini computer. And uh, that's how it all began program the front office and that same Miramar Sheridan was the first customer. So you created a property management system business in the days before most hoteliers knew what a property management system even was. What was the growth like in those early days? Was it really slow to start out? From uh, 800,000 in the first year to uh, 2 million to 4 to uh, 12 to 18 to 24 to 30 million and these are all 1980 uh, Boy, 1981, two and three dollars. Yep. So Absolutely. that's about the same as a hundred million dollar business today. Wow, those are some numbers that startups even today, almost four decades later, would be pretty happy with. A lot of companies think that the only way to get to that kind of scale is through enterprise deals. And I know that you pioneered one of the early ones. Can you talk about the partnership that you had with Marriott? I licensed it to Marriott in uh, 1982. And uh, Marriott was to use it for a brand new concept that uh, was being developed called Courtyard. And they told me there would be 50 courtyards. And so we licensed it accordingly and uh, went through all the effort of getting ready to put multiple hotels on a single mini computer, which was rare, but I had done it numerous times for other smaller chains. Yep. And uh, we got $3 million from Marriott for a universal license for the Courtyard hotels. That was a lot of money back in those days. And we sold them the MAI hardware, and the usual markup was about 25%. So I can look at uh, about $14 million that we build Marriott. So that's not bad at all. But they had the rights. I had no idea that Marriott would then begin to uh, call this Fosse and distribute it through Springfield, Fairfield, uh, Resonance Inns. Uh, just name all of their auxiliary products other than the Marriott and JW Marriott branded hotels. Right. And uh, today, it is now 36 years later, they are just coming to end of life on using it in 2,200 hotels. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> A lot more than 50. 
I think to most of our listeners, it's going to be pretty unbelievable that a company like Marriott kept the same systems in place for almost 40 years, especially a company like that that's known for innovation and really being at the forefront of technology. But I'd like to point out that it's really not just Marriott. I mean, we've had some massive innovations in the consumer and industrial sector when it comes to technology, things like cloud computing and universal access to Wi-Fi. And despite all of this, there's been really no rethinking of what it means to be a property management system and the job to be done. Can you talk about where you see the property management system playing a role in the hotel tech stack of the future? The real question is, uh, where were we way back in the 80s when this became the absolute mandate for every hotel over 15 rooms. And where are we today? And that story is the story we need to concentrate on. So in 1980 or 82 or 84, all of the central reservation systems were written in the 60s. And uh, they were on mainframes. In fact, some of those systems still survive today, despite the fact that Amadeus is rewriting IHSs, IHCs. Uh, there are other systems like Marsha that uh, survived from the 60s. Yes, it's true that the UI has changed, but it's not true that uh, it's still flat files on a mainframe from computer. And uh, that uh, will certainly evolve over time. But the central reservation systems own the guest name record. And the guest name record is the critical element we need to talk about. The PMS systems are, for the chains at least, becoming increasingly less important as they handle right now, in-house functions only. So guest history, which used to be a gigantic, important part of a PMS system, has been stripped in most systems and is now very much part of the central reservation system. Whether you want a foam pillow or a special kind of uh, uh, anti-allergic something, uh, now is known chain-wide as opposed to just at that property where you made the request way back when. That's important. Uh, how many stays you've had and where you've had them for analytics for big data is uh, really important. In fact, that's one of the things that uh, Cindy Estes Screens Company uses now as input from many of the chains to help the chains to understand better who their customers are, where they're going, occupancy and future occupancy. Big data is being uh, used in very important ways, but certainly not from the PMS system anymore. So that leads to the question of, do we need a PMS system in the future? And the answer is, for the short run, yes. Uh, Property-based systems uh, get rid of the problem of dependence upon uh, any form of Ethernet or outside communications. And in some areas of the country, that still is a problem, uh, the reliability of those systems. So the bottom line is, if we look ahead 10 years, and certainly beyond 10 years, it would be easy to see a single cloud-based system integrating everything from uh, uh, CRM, uh, customer uh, management, to reservations, to the accounting functions at the properties, all the way through all forms of marketing and follow-through. And then we have a single guest name record that doesn't have to pass through from one system to another to be validated that they are the same. What happens if right. someone changes an address when he's standing in front of a front desk? All of those things go away. So the future is a single CRM system does all this work. And when you say there's going to be a single PMS system or centralized system that's going to take care of all of those functions, do you mean to say that hotels are only going to have one type of software? Or do you think that there's room for specialists in different categories? So you're always going to have best of breed in some areas. Take, for example, revenue management, which is a very important part of all of this. Uh, it can either be a feature in a central reservation system or it can control everything else, depending on where the real revenue is coming from. So revenue management systems may end up being more important, for example, than uh, CRM systems. And certainly both of them more important than just a simple accounting system at the front desk. Right. So we have some things to understand and uh, to evolve over this next uh, half a decade to decade. And it's going to be interesting. This is not a stagnant industry, despite the fact that people think that every hotel has a system. Therefore, yep. the industry is mature. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. You briefly touched on the growing importance of systems like CRMs, uh, customer relationship management, CRS, central reservation systems, 
and even touched on revenue management systems. I know you have quite uh, an extensive history in the revenue management space. Can you talk about your experience there and how it's informed your view on the market today? So I was called uh, by Jim Yoakum at the time at uh, Marriott, and I was called uh, by, I've just forgotten the name of the person at Hyatt, but Marriott and Hyatt, both of them called me to their offices, Hyatt Chicago, Marriott Washington, to talk about their system and how it could be made into something that was much more, that was something more like the airline system. In the case of Marriott, they had what they had uh, termed tier pricing. You become 80% occupied in a future date. You uh, close to government and other cheap rates. You become 90%, you raise the rates by 10%. Become 100%, you raise the rates some more. That was tier pricing, and that's all they had. Hyatt had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so both of them said, what can you do? And I went home from both of those meetings and said, what can I do? And the thought immediately occurred to me to copy the airlines. I happened to be a reseller from uh, Burroughs, which became Unisys. And uh, Burroughs let me in to see what was going on at Piedmont Airlines. And Piedmont had copied Sabre. I mean, this is all a uh, very insipid industry, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I came in and saw the Piedmont system. I uh, came back and said, even I can do that better. And so as I came back on the airplane from seeing the Piedmont system, I was up all night in a uh, overnight flight designing what I thought to be a yield management system that would work for hotels. I wanted something different. Artificial intelligence was one of those terms you threw around back in those days like we are today. But in those <laughs> days, it was you know, much more, uh, much more gravitas. So I called somebody I knew who had three programmers from MIT who knew how to program in the LISP language, L-I-S-P, which was the programming language of artificial intelligence. It ran on a Unix-based machine that uh, was made by Texas Instruments. So I found these three programmers and hired them. I went to Texas Instruments literally by flying to Austin and having a meeting with them, telling them what I intended to do and getting their buy-in. And we together designed the very first artificial intelligence yield management system. So we had Sinestis system, and we had one other system we sold to the Bosanna uh, Resort, which later became a Disney resort. That was two systems, 150000 apiece. The owner of Sinesta refused to pay for it because he thought he could do it on the back of a, of a napkin. But I bought back the system from Sinesta. I bought back the system from Vistana. And I told my chief programmer, Tom Shonoff, to uh, take this code, forget the fact that it's artificial intelligence, and make it a feature in the reservation system. It probably had 80% of the functionality, and we released it for an $8,000 check-the-box feature. And virtually every customer we had at the time began to order it. Wow. And yield management it became something people could afford, so they bought it, even if they didn't use it, and many of them didn't. It <laughs> uh, was the beginning, and that was 1988. Wow, so that year, 1988, was really the year that hotels started using data to make decisions about pricing globally. It's a huge transformational shift in the industry. As we look forward, what do you think the next 5, 10, 15 years look like? And where are some of the most important changes happening in the market? Analytics are everything. And decisions are going to be made by analytics that are created by machines. There are a lot of people who will lose their jobs and then maybe be retrained or other people take those jobs that are now menial that are doing posting, and especially in the back office, uh, are going to have to be replaced by people or by machine uh, analytics, and people then act upon those analytics. And so the most important single change that's going to come is the fact that every piece of data that uh, arrives at the central source, whether it be from a query and a lost sale, whether it be from a, a booking uh, at a low price that might have been upsold, whether it be an honored guest that uh, was rebuffed because there was no occupancy. I'm giving many examples, but there are hundreds of them. Yep. will be analyzed, and uh, you're going to find that uh, much more capable decisions will be made to maximize revenue than have ever been possible before based upon AI and data analytics. That's your future. I definitely agree that business intelligence is a huge part of the future as we get a more sophisticated and granular understanding of where people are coming from, how profitable certain segments are, and other things like that. 
But to a large extent, hotels are still using some of these tools and data sets of the past and are waiting around on Tuesday for their comp set report. You got to think of STAR and Concur and a lot of these others as the uh, equivalent of the central reservation systems of the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to have them. They just haven't figured out yet how to make it, uh, you said granular, and that's a good way of saying it, make it uh, actionable enough to be worth Absolutely. the kind of money we need to pay today. Wow. So STAR is up for disruption, property management systems, CRS, CRM, pretty much everything is on the chopping block here. What are some of the most exciting opportunities that you're seeing today? I think that uh, if we look at hotel tech and expand it to travel tech, which is really where Wayfair Ventures, our uh, latest firm, uh, investment firm, is operating, <clears throat> there are a lot of them that do things that have nothing to do with what we were used to in the past. If you can yeah. get a plane in and out of a gate uh, five minutes faster and multiply that by the number of planes and gates that there are going in and out of airports in the U.S., you can save multiple billions of dollars. I mean, that sounds strange over a year's time. If you can do the same thing in hotels by better serving a guest, by upselling that guest, by finding out whether guest satisfaction is uh, a problem or an opportunity, meaning can you sell them meals even if the meals are delivered by a third party from outside the hotel? Whatever it be, there are lots of opportunities now for revenue that uh, weren't easily available in the past, but are today. But uh, the whole point uh, is if guest satisfaction goes up and uh, guests are able to do things they couldn't do before, like order a meal from text, uh, you're going to have better revenue and more satisfaction. And those are the ones, the applications that are going to make some sense. I agree with you there. We're seeing a huge amount of demand for guest messaging software on Hotel Tech Report. We also see a lot of hoteliers looking for merchandising and upselling tools that can help them improve the guest experience while generating more revenue per guest, which is really a win-win on both sides. When you look at the investment landscape and your current portfolio, are there any companies that you're really excited about today? Think of the hotel pool, the hotel spa, all of those things, even the gym, which uh, lay fallow during many hours a day, especially in uh, city hotels that are principally business occupied. So a little company called Resort Pass, which is one of our investments, uh, came along and said, what would happen if we uh, contract with a hotel to bring in outside guests who are members of Resort Pass who make a reservation to use the pool for two hours from uh, two to four o'clock in the afternoon when the pool would have never been used at all uh, in a typical business hotel. Absolutely. Or the same thing with a spa or any of the other services. And the answer was these hotels love it because it's ancillary revenue for fixed assets that uh, really have no other form of uh, revenue generation because they're free to the guest. Resort Pass has been really well received by the market. Like you said, it's almost a no-brainer for hotels. Why wouldn't you want to leverage and get some more revenue out of these underutilized spaces? I don't know the Resort Pass team personally, but I know a lot of the other founders that you've invested with, people like Adam and Richard over at Cloudbeds and John and Chris over at Whistle. Are there characteristics that you think really make great entrepreneurs stand out from the pack? I love it when... Somebody in marketing or sales develops a company and says, I feel the pain and let's try and solve the need, as opposed to what I see most often, which is an engineer says, I really got an idea and I'm going to make that idea work. Yeah. And it's like pushing the rock up the hill because they didn't do the research. And I have good stories about companies that flamed out, including some of my own, that <laughs> didn't do the research in advance and end up paying the price. I know when you're investing in companies, you will generally look at the founders and see the quality of the team as one of your key drivers or theses around an investment. But the other huge aspect is how big is the market and what are the market trends going on? So I wanted to ask, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in the market and that you think have the strongest legs behind them? That is a moving target. That if you were to say I had an app eight years ago, 10 years ago, we might have been really excited because there weren't enough apps out there. Yeah. Today, if you say you have an app, we're just kind of <laughs> going to face the other way. 
Yep. Uh, so the today answer is uh, we're looking very much at AI and robotics uh, and data analytics. Tomorrow is going to be something else and it's going to be more sophisticated yet. So if I had to answer it today, it's those three things. So you're looking at AI, robotics, and analytics. Now, robotics less so, but AI and analytics begs the question, as we have a large hotelier audience on the show, do you think that the role of a general manager in a hotel is going to change in the coming years? It seems like we're moving away from an operationally focused GM, not to say that that's not important anymore, but in the future, there's actually a huge shift towards being more analytical and almost acting like a product manager what do you think that the GM of the future looks like? The uh, high-tech keynote that I gave uh, in Toronto two years ago was entitled, Will Tech Take Your Job? And it was addressed toward those managers and to the financial managers who were there in the audience. And the answer is, there are so many things that will be taken over, not necessarily by robotics. That's the uh, cleaning and the other things, uh, perhaps delivery to guests. It's more the kinds of things that a manager has to learn to do to add value. Right. And a manager has to be able to add value by adding revenue and by increasing guest satisfaction. Those two things are not operational necessarily. And it's the operational thing that a manager today normally concentrates on. Tomorrow right. that manager is going to be a data analyst and he's going to be very much a marketing person, despite the fact that he'll have a department that supposedly is at the property or in the chain to do that for him or her. I 100% agree with you there. And where there's crisis, there's always opportunity. I think that the general managers that are able to capitalize on this trend and sharpen up their skills are going to find that there's more opportunity than ever before in this market to add value and really take their careers to the next level. Dave, we're definitely going to need to have you back on the show because there's just not nearly enough time to talk about all of your stories and experience. And I know that our community is just going to benefit so much from your insights. Thank you so much for making the time today and look forward to having you back soon. Very good. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I got bridges. I got matches, but I got limits. You'll never see them. I'll cut and run before you get near them. Bite the hand, despite the trap. Save the body, trust the map. Feet don't fail me, we can bail. Let's keep the shell intact. To hell and back and not a slogan on a shirt to show. I want you bad and I don't show it, but it hurts to go. It's feast of famine. I honestly kind of hate both. And I'm drowning in this optional. Tell me what's impossible and I'll tell you slow down. I promise if you do, I'll stick